Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to tell stories the rest of the morning, and I really want us to get this passage because it's a phenomenal word from God, I think, this morning from 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to start reading with verse 13. The title of the sermon is, Be Prepared. Be prepared to be holy in all that you do. Here's what it says, starting with verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Prepare for action. Prepare for what? Prepare for anything. I, I learned in a whole new respect this last 10 days or 12 days what it means to be prepared. When you drive to the end of the road, put what you have with you on a boat and go another 10 or 12 miles north, you either have it with you or you don't. Now, I, I have to say there's a quantification with that. Being prepared means you either have it with you or you have a plan. Um, since my son is a pilot, his friends are pilots, and they did fly across and buzz our camp on Monday this last week. Uh, we had an hour and a half of sunshine on Monday, the only sunshine we had when we were out there. They buzzed our camp, and uh, they came across the water. They kind of circled around, came back, flew down about 30, 40 feet above our camp, came zipping across at the last second. They tilted the plane a little bit on the side. They kicked the box out the door, and uh, needless to say, on Monday night, we have massive, juicy pork chops for our last meal out in the wilderness. And they brought us extra gas. We had extra gas. It was an awesome experience. But what does it mean to be prepared? What does it mean to be ready? I, I thought about it yesterday morning. I'm standing there on the start line of this marathon, and I'm saying to myself, it'd be a poor time to try start preparing for a marathon right now. Granted, I didn't do as much preparation as I should have, but there was preparation done. Brianna, don't laugh too much. But, but there was preparation done, and so I was a little bit ready for this run. But you don't prepare for a marathon standing on the start line. You don't prepare for a bear hunt in the wilderness when you're standing on the beach 50 miles from town. You don't prepare for action with your mind until you're out there ready to share Christ with somebody. You don't prepare then. You prepare your mind now. You get ready now. A man once said one morning, I went out of my house to get in my car and go to church, and I had a flat tire. But I was prepared. I had a spare tire. I took the spare tire out of my car, I put it on my car, and I drove to church. It was awesome, he said. And I told myself I would later fix the flat tire so it's ready for the next experience. However, five days later when I went out to my car to go to school and had another flat tire, I realized I was not prepared because I hadn't fixed the tire, and so I had to roll it down to the local tire shop, Emmy Miller Tire, I suppose. I had to roll it down to the local tire shop, have it repaired, roll it back, and put it on my car. We've got to be prepared, whatever it is in life. Henry Ford said, before everything else, getting ready is the secret to success. John F. Kennedy said, the time to repair a roof is when the sun is shining. Abraham Lincoln said, if I have six hours to chop down a tree, I will spend the first hour sharpening my axe. Someone said once, you don't lie in bed at night awake thinking about and preparing for success or how you're going to succeed. He said, instead, you sleep and you stay awake during the day so you can succeed. Prepare your minds. That's our first point. God calls us to prepare our minds. He says this. He says, therefore, prepare your mind for action. You have got to be ready. And, and in all of life, there's always going to be something coming along, and we have to be ready for what that is. And so when we were going to bear camp, we were ready. No, Rodney and I didn't shoot a bear, but we were ready when the bear came. And Well, when they're outside your tent in the middle of the night and their jaws are chomping, Preparation at that point 
resolves itself to prayer. And I said to myself, I said, Lord, I'm laying here maybe eight or ten feet away from this bear who's chomping his jaws. If he decides to eat me, at least give him a little indigestion. But prayer was a part of that, and I, I was able to sleep at night because I could rest. We've got to prepare our minds. What does it mean to prepare our minds? What does it mean to be ready? An old man, Morris was his name, was on a construction site. He was an old guy. He was, he was the old buzzard, yeah, guys, that worked with him said, the old buzzard. The old buzzard was sitting around with the young bucks, and this one guy was very arrogant, and, and he was talking smack all the time, and he was walking back and forth in front of everybody. He goes, man, he said, I'm the strongest guy on this job site here. I can build things and do things better than anybody else and faster and stronger, and I'm better. And the old buzzer just sat back there on the side on, with his lunchbox just listening to the young guy flap his jaws and brag. And finally, the old buzzer said, you know, you may be young and strong and filled with all kinds of your intelligence to do things but I can move something that you can't move back. And the young guy goes, oh, you old buzzard, what are you going to do? You can't do anything that I can't move back. And he goes, yes, I'll bet you my paycheck on it. And the guy said, you're on, you're on. And so he hopped up from his spot beside his lunch bucket, went over, grabbed the, the wheelbarrow that was sitting there, wheeled it over, said to the young guy, he said, hop in this wheelbarrow. I'm going to move you over to that pile, and I want to watch you move yourself back in the wheelbarrow. Prepare your minds for action. You have got to be ready. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, it says, Therefore, I urge you as brothers and sisters, to, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you'll be able to test and to prove what God's will is, God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. We've got to prepare our minds for action. In Mark 12, when Jesus was asked what the greatest command was, he was told, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and then to love your neighbors yourself. We've got to prepare our minds for action. We've got to prepare our bodies for action. We have got to be ready. And renewing our minds is, is means that we've got to stop thinking about the things that we think about when we're living in the human nature and begin to say, what does God call us to? And what does God want from us? When I was in the wilderness with my sons, I had a lot of time to think. For eight days, six days in the wilderness, I had a day of travel at each end. For six days, I had no computer. I had no cell phone. I had no internet connection. And my son found a spot on this one point that he had a little signal. So he, he emailed or texted his wife, and that's how we ended up getting the pork chops. It's kind of awesome. But, but I had no technology for six days. Now, for some of you, you're saying, well, that's not a big deal. That's a big deal for me. My phone is never far away. It never stops ringing or emailing or texting me. And I'm, I'm teaching Brad about texting. Yesterday I, taught, I texted Brad. Brad's getting really good at this. We, we need to get him a phone that has a full keyboard, though. He's still having a hard time punching the button three times. But, but I texted Brad, and I said, Brad said, how are you doing after the marathon? I said, I'm not sure what I was thinking about preaching tomorrow. And Brad said this. This is Brad. He said, We've got to live life on the edge. Ha ha. <laughs> it's like, Brad, you know, Brad's a jokester. He, he's got it going. He, he understood this whole notion of preparing your minds for action. We've got to be ready, and we've got to prepare our minds for action. Philippians 4 says this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Isn't that beautiful? Prepare your minds for action. Be ready. What our mind is thinking about and focusing on is what we're getting ready for. We've got to prepare our minds for action. We've got to prepare our minds for the future. We've got to prepare our things for what is coming. Winston, uh, President Nixon once was talking with Winston Churchill's son, and he said to Winston Churchill's son, he said, I love to listen to the prime minister's extemporaneous speeches. And the son said, And I have watched the prime minister spend countless hours in preparation for the extemporaneous speeches. You see, 
It's preparing ourselves for action. We've got to be ready. Philipp, uh, Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. In Matthew 26, Jesus was preparing to die and he took his disciples to the wilderness, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the place called Gethsemane. And he, he asked them to pray and he prayed this. He said, he said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And then he said to, to Peter and Zebedee, the two sons of Zebedee, and he said to them, he said, Stay here and keep watch with me. And then this was his prayer. He said, My father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. Yet, not as I will, but your will be done. We've got to prepare our minds for action. Are we ready? D.L. Moody once went to a church service and a young man was preaching. The young man preached a good sermon. And at the end of his sermon, he gave an altar call. And, and after the altar call, no one responded. He was talking with D.L. Moody. And he said to D.L. Moody, he said, D.L., I, I don't understand. He said, I, I thought I preached what God had laid on my heart. And I thought I preached a sermon that was well rooted in the word of God. And it was a powerful sermon. And nobody responded. And when you preach, D.L., people just come by the hundreds to the altar. I don't understand. And D.L. Moody said, Sir, he said, young man, he said, surely you don't expect all these people to come to the altar, do you? And the young man said, well, no. And D.L. Moody said, that's the problem. You're not ready. You're not preparing it. You're not setting it up for that. You see, as a people, we've got to prepare our minds for action. And that's where it starts. We've got to get into the Word of God, and we've got to be ready. What's coming is coming. If you've ever listened to Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey says, we have these things called emergency funds, but in reality, they're not emergency funds because we know something is coming. And if we prepare ourselves, we know that we have this fund, but it's a fund that's for the things that are unexpected, but they're really expected because we know that the unexpected is coming. You get the idea? In other words, it's not unexpected because we expect the unexpected. We have to be ready. We have to prepare our minds. God has a work for us. Are we ready? How many of you here expect to share Christ with someone that has never heard about him in the next 24 hours? Are we ready? Prepare your minds. Be ready. Expect that the unexpected is going to happen. Therefore, it's really not unexpected, but it's expected. The second thing is prepare your bodies. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled and set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. To me, this being self-controlled really means talking about preparing our bodies for action. A lady named Mary, she said she worked in a care center or a hospital, and she took a 104-year-old patient on a walk down the halls. They came back, and she sat, he sat down on his bed, and he looked at her, and he said, Ha, oh, that was good. I don't feel a day over 100. What does it mean for us to physically be ready? Well, I, I learned a little something about being physically ready. I, I ran, this is my third marathon that I ran yesterday, and it was the least prepared I've been of the three. And today, it's kind of horrible. Uh, I'm a little sore, a little stiff. Going up and down these stairs make Brad grin because Brad says, you know, they can tell who the Mexican is of the two of us, but they sure can't tell who the old man is right now because you waddle worse than I do, Glenn. <laughs> so... What does it mean for us to prepare our bodies? It means that we have to be it's tuned saying, okay, God, what is it you want me to do and how do I prepare myself for what that is that you want me to do? Am I ready? Do I, am I ready to live my life to the fullest? Am I ready to live my life in the way you want? And God says in the scripture, he says that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do I understand that this is where God resides and that God wants this body ready for action? Now, he's not saying that we're all going to be a size three, dude, I... Size three was when I was three. I'm not going to be a size three. I'm never going to be a skinny mini. But, but I have to have my body ready for what it is that God wants me to do. I have to be ready. Preparation is the key. If ready, preparing for that marathon, all I did was walk two miles a day, I'm not ready to run a marathon. It's not going to happen. I did some running before the marathon yesterday, and it was still painful. Walking in preparation would not work. 1 Timothy 4 says this, 
Have nothing to do with godless myths or old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Paul is telling us that physical training is of some value. We need to take care of our bodies so that we are ready to do the work that God has for us. The third thing I want us to learn from this passage, and it goes back again. All these go back to that from Mark 12's passage where it says that we are to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says this in this passage. He says we are to prepare our hearts. Obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Being holy should be our heart's desire. The problem is, our heart's desire is not always to be what God wants it to be. Our heart's desire gets caught up in the human nature. We desire ourselves and what we want for ourselves. And that's not always in tune with what God wants. And we, we focus on the wrong things. We're, we're afraid that if I focus on God, I might lose my taste for the things around me. And that's what God wants. That's why he tells us in Scripture, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God wants us to draw near to him. And, and so often we're afraid that if I focus on God, I might lose out on the pleasures of life. And in reality, that's what God wants. And they're not pleasures. We need to stop that kind of language. I, I remember a, a while back, I was thinking about this whole thing. I hear these comments about the good old days. And I, I've made the comment, my, one of the things that my dad has said often is my dad has said, I wish I would have. And I told Brad one day, I said, you know, Brad, I don't want to live my life and be 60 years old or 62 or 70 and say, I wish I would have. Now, granted, there are the wish I would have. In other words, I wish I would have done some things different. I, I've screwed up a lot back there. But, but when it comes to doing stuff, you know, like going on a bear hunt and sleeping in a tent with bears, I, I don't want to be 60 years old saying, man, I wish I would have done that. So just do it, right? You know, I, I don't want to, to stand on the edge of a wing of an airplane and think about jumping out and saying later, I wish I would have. Dude, just jump. I mean, you might want to have a parachute, but just jump. See, in life, we need to stop living with the wish I would have and be ready. So, so when we talk about being prepared and preparing our heart, it means focusing on what God desires for us. How can I honor and glorify God with my whole life? Listen as I read again from Paul's writing from 1 Timothy chapter 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we could take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into the temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of every kind of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered far from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. What the scripture is describing to us is that life is going to be filled with challenges and God wants us to keep our focus on Him. When Moses came down from the mountain, what was so amazing to the people? Was it the Ten Commandments? No. The amazing thing to the people was the fact that Moses radiated God from the essence of who He was. He had to put a blanket or a sheet over Him because He glowed People saw that, and they glowed. Have we ourselves, are we in the presence of God so much that people say, wow, that dude is filled with God. That woman is filled with God. Do that, whatever we may be. Are we filled with God so much? There was a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards that lived from 1703 to 1758. He was credited with preaching a sermon that started the Great Awakening in, in England in 1734. They went from 1734 to 1744. Jonathan Edwards was a brilliant theologian whose sermons had an overwhelming impact on people. His sermon that was most famous, though, as starting the Great Awakening was titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, moved hundreds to repentance and changed everything. But here's what most people don't know about Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was a guy that had poor eyesight. He wore thick glasses. His sermons were all manuscript, and he would lean over to read his sermons because his eyesight was bad. And yet people were just moved by the hundreds when he preached. 
The single message that sparked a revolution, he kept praying this prayer, and he was, he was struggling. He wanted God's movement. And, and John Chapman says a story like this. He says, for three days, Jonathan Edwards had not eaten a mouthful of food. For three nights, Jonathan Edwards had not even closed his eyes in sleep. Over and over again, he was heard to pray, O oh Lord, give me New England. Give me New England. When he rose from his knees and made his way to the pulpit that Sunday, he looked as if he had been gazing straight into the face of God. And even before he began to speak, tremendous conviction began to fall on his audience. Holiness was Jonathan Edwards' desire in life. And he spent time working on shaping his mind, preparing his body, and preparing his heart for action. God calls all of us to prepare ourselves, to prepare our minds for action, to prepare our bodies for action, to shape our heart around who God is, and to be the people he wants. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who was a justice of the peace, nominated by Theodore Roosevelt, he said it like this. To reach the port of heaven, we must sail, sometimes with wind and sometimes against it, but we must sail. We must not drift nor lie at anchor. If you've ever sailed, it's an exhilarating feeling when you're going with the wind. You zip along. It's awesome. You just There's no sound because you're moving at the speed of wind. Everything is silent. You hear the ripple of the boat through the water. But it's awesome. But if you sail with the wind, most often you will have to go against the wind to return to the dock. And learning to sail against the wind is an art and a challenge. And it's not a direct shot, but it's back and forth, cutting across. And in life, it's the same way. There are those days we sail with the wind. When we were going out across the water to the north country, to Burners Bay, it was an exhilarating feeling. When we got to the mud flats and we towed the boat for a half or three quarters of a mile across six inch deep water and moving it along, pulling it by hand, waiting in the water, that was a challenge. But it was all worth it because we were ready and we were prepared. In our life, we're going to experience mud flats. We're going to experience waves and difficulties. We've got to be ready. We've got to be prepared to be holy because God is holy and he calls us to holiness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this call you've given to us to be holy because you're holy. Thank you, God, for the way you love us and care for us and have equipped us and endowed us with your Holy Spirit and your word that we can become like you each day, that we can be ready for the task you've put before us. And I pray, God, that as we leave here today, you would strengthen us and empower us. Help us, God, to do the work you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Continue our worship in a time of...